Today, I want to uh, look at a passage of Scripture. If you've got a Bible, you can turn to John chapter 9. It's where we're going to be reading today. John chapter 9, verse 1, and we're just going to read a few passages there. John chapter 9, verse 1, it says, As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. But it happens so that the work of God might be displayed in him. I must do the works of him who sent me while it is still day. Night is coming when no one can work. And while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he had said this, he spat on the ground and made clay with his saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went away and washed and he returned seeing. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word that we can open it and we can read it and it can change uh, the very fabric of our being. And God, as we discuss this incredible passage of scripture over the next few minutes, I pray that you'd open our eyes, you'd open our hearts, you'd open our minds to receive what you have to say to us today. It's in your name we ask this, the strong son of God. Amen. I want you to think about the moment that we're reading about for a second. Here is Jesus and people who followed him now for a year or two. This is about midway through his ministry. These are, these are devoted followers of Jesus. And they walk by this random blind man. Up until the point of the disciples saying something about it, Jesus hadn't pointed him out, nothing. And, and the disciples look at Jesus and they say, Jesus, we got a couple questions for you about this blind guy over here. Why is this guy blind? What, what made this guy blind? The, the passage tells us that the disciples and Jesus were aware that this guy was blind from birth. So either it was obvious to them that this guy had been blind his entire life, or there was some, there was some kind of a tell sign that they knew this guy had been blind from birth. And they ask Jesus, why is this guy blind? And they ask him two very interesting questions on, on the other end of that. They say, Jesus, is it his fault he's born blind? Is it his fault he's born blind? Is, did he do something like before he was born that made him be blind? Did, did his parents do something that made him be blind? Jesus, what, what's the reason that this guy can't see? What's the point in this guy being blind? Now, for those of y'all who are, are a little geeky with your scripture and, and you know a little bit of the historical context, most people in this, in this time period thought that if you were born with um, some kind of a handicap or a deformity or something, that people just assumed that it was actually the sin of your parents that caused this. That it was actually the sin of the parents that would cause somebody to be born blind or to be born without a leg or be born um, messed up in some, in some way, not, not perfect. And what's interesting about this passage, though, is not just the question that they ask, but who is asking the question. I don't know about you married people, but I have found that there's a difference in some questions when random people ask it and your wife ask it. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's, sometimes there is a definite difference between random person that you meet in the supermarket asking you what you think about something and what your wife says. For instance, my wife will tell me on a regular basis, hey, what you're wearing looks good. Hey, what you're wearing doesn't look good. This has, I don't think that this has anything to do with her affection towards me. I think she just doesn't want to be married to someone who looks stupid. You know what I'm saying? Like, like there's a different reasoning behind her saying something and, me, and, and somebody else saying, hey, something about your outfit. The, depending on the questions that are being asked, it changes the value of the question. And these are people who have an inside track to Jesus. These are people that if you read through the book of John, they've seen Jesus perform miracle after miracle after miracle. They've seen water turned into wine. They've seen him prophetically speak to the woman at the well. They've seen him feed thousands of people with a loaf of bread and, or with a few loaves of bread and fish. They've seen him do insane amounts of miracles, more so than, than we probably will ever see in our lifetime. But yet when they go to ask the question, 
when they go to ask the question about this blind man, they're not asking Jesus, Jesus, what, are your, what do you think we should do with the blind guy? Jesus, are you going to heal the blind man? Jesus, what, what's going to happen with this man? What can you do to change this man's life? No, 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 no. Nobody asked that question. The question that they asked, why is this guy blind? And I think that, that this question is indicative of where we live in our life. And that is, for whatever reason, no matter how, how well we know a fix, no matter how well we know what would make a situation better, no matter, no matter how uh, much we, empathize, we could empathize with somebody, when we see something that is wrong, when we see something that is messed up, for whatever reason, we choose to be more interested in how they got there than a solution to get better. I mean, let's think about the shows that we watch on TV. It, statistically, if you are between the ages of 35 and 75, that's a pretty big gap, right? You all watch either NCIS, CSI, or some show that deals with forensic science. How many of y'all, like, like, that's you, that's you. You are one of those people. I, like, you're, you're either Law and Order, Law and Order SVU, Law and Order, blah, 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 because there's like 80 of them, you know? Like, but it's, it's, this, it's this thing that we are obsessed with this idea of being able to see a problem and see an issue and be able to point our finger at exactly what caused the issue, at exactly what causes the problem. So much so, I, I think that for many of us, we can become in our own lives less curious about what it takes to get us to a place of wholeness and health and get us to a place where Jesus has called us to be, but we become more interested in the why we are where we are. Now, now here's the deal. I'm not like missing the point that God gave us like an intellect or God gave us the ability to rationalize and think for ourselves. I'm not saying that at all. But, but I think that for many of us, we find ourselves in times that are difficult, in times where we've gone through hard, hardships in our life. I feel like there for many of us, we can find ourselves obsessed, not with the thing that will change our situation, but with the thing that got us to the situation we currently find ourselves in. And this isn't like an adult issue. This isn't an adult issue at all. Uh, this is actually an issue that we see across the board. Uh, for the last 10 months, um, as, as I've transitioned my role here to be the next gen pastor, I have spent a lot of time with your children. And I love your children. Your children are so entertaining. And, and no matter what age, whether they're like one years old infant or they are in elementary school or middle school or even high school, there's just something fun about being around kids at all different stages of life. There's just something entertaining about it. And there, there are many of you that I've stopped you and told you, hey, this is this awesome thing about your kid because they're just fun to get to know. But let me tell you something about your kids. They are expert, fin expert finger pointers. You know what I'm saying? Like they, they know how the blame thing works. You know, like they understand that if something bad happens and in their head, if they can make it seem like somebody else's fault, then they're all good. You know, like they understand this. And we see this week after week after week in kids ministry. Let me, let me give you a, um, a for instance. Now this is not a specific story. This is a culmination of stories uh, that have happened in kids ministry over the last 10 months. Now, let me say this. If you think I'm talking about your kid, I probably am. Um, so you have little Johnny and little Susie, and we'll stick little Johnny and little Susie in the third or in the three-year-old classroom, okay? Little Johnny and little Susie are in the three-year-old classroom, and it's their favorite time. It's snack time. We give them Cheerios because they're a gluten-free and healthy snack here at Gen U. Um, but no, no, no. So they, are, so they are sitting there, they get a little cup with, let's, let's say, 10 Cheerios. I don't, I don't know how many we give them. They get these little tiny little snack cups that are like just bigger than a shot glass, not that I would know. Uh, but I, like, it's just there, and they, they get their own little cups with their Cheerios, and they're sitting there eating their Cheerios. And little Susie is a hair more on the hungry side than little Johnny. And little Susie has killed her little snack cup. 
I mean, all 10 Cheerios, that was like two bites. You know, she was eating them like it was still Thanksgiving, you know. And I mean, she's just going to town. And she looks over at little Johnny, and she notices that little Johnny is what we like to call a slow eater. And little Johnny hadn't put like three Cheerios in his mouth the whole time. But he's just, in, he's enjoying his, his Cheerios. Maybe he got honey nut that morning. I don't know. And so he's enjoying his Cheerio time. And because little Susie is the princess at her home, she thinks that she's the princess everywhere. And little Susie looks over at little Bobby and she gives him this look of, I have power over you. And she knocks his cup down. And she takes three Cheerios and she puts them in her mouth and smugly looks at him like, what you going to do about it? I'm the princess. You know, and like you could just see this interaction in between these two kids. And she thinks she's gotten away with it. But oh, no, Bobby don't think she's the princess. Bobby just got triggered and now it's prison rules. You know, like Bobby is upset that somebody took his Cheerios. And so he looks over and he like full on just drop kicks little Susie's chair off and little Susie goes rolling on the floor over to the door. Now, not because he's that strong, he's three years old, but because Susie knew she needed to make an example of how much force that little Bobby hit her with. And so little Susie is gone. And the teacher having witnessed all of this walks over and decides to give them an opportunity to be honest about the situation. And the teacher walks over to little Bobby and little Susie and she says, what happened? And little Susie, with tears, crocodile tears in her eyes, she points and she says, hey, that's me. And that's supposed to mean he did this to me, but she's three, so she's not the clearest kid on the planet. So, uh, so she's sitting there and she's pointing the finger and saying, he did this to me, this is all his fault. Having no remorse for taking his Cheerios. Now, little Bobby has one of two options. He can either choose to just bald face lie and be like, I don't know what happened to her. She's, clump- she's three. She hadn't gotten the balance thing down yet. You know, like, she can, he can either go there or little Bobby can choose to be like, look, she stole my Cheerios. Prison rules. You know, like, like this, is, this is what happens when you steal Cheerios at Generations United. I go gangster. You know, like, he doesn't know what to do. But at the end of the day, by the time the teacher has gotten involved, you know what both of these two people have in common? They no longer care about the Cheerios. They're just now both in a game to point fingers at each other. And we find ourselves, whether we're three years old or 30 or 60 years old, oftentimes in these same places where it becomes more about the blame of the situation and being able to recount exactly what happened to tell people why I am where I am than having a moment with Jesus and allowing it to change me on the inside. And I believe with all my heart that when I read this passage in John, that Jesus is not talking to people specifically about one person. I think that he's actually looking to incite two miracles in this passage. The first one being a man that is physically blind. He is dealing with with a man that he is about to heal. But he is also dealing with a group of people that know him, that have followed him, that have been with him, and know the power of Jesus, but yet are more interested in the process of fault and the process of blame than they are seeing Jesus do something supernatural in the life of the person that they're walking by. Jesus, Jesus, when he's asked about this blame, he responds in an interesting way. He says, he says, it's not this man's sin or his parents that have made him be blind. It's neither one of their faults. This man is blind so that the work of God might be produced in him. And what I, what I want to make sure that everybody is clear on is Jesus is not saying in this passage, well, we made this guy blind from birth so that I could heal him when I was 30. That's not what Jesus is saying at all. What he's saying, what he is saying to this person is, look, I don't really even care why he is blind right now. 
I don't care if it's mama's fault. I don't care if it's his fault. I don't care what, what the issue is. I'm not concerned with that. What I'm concerned with is that God wants to touch him in this moment. What I'm concerned with is that God's good work wants to produce something in his life that will move him from being of a state of blindness to a place of seeing. And I think for many of us, what we sometimes miss in the Christian faith is that, yes, it is healthy to understand why you got where you are. Yes, it is healthy to understand kind of the steps that, that, that you've made that were, that were a mistake, or maybe even to understand completely that something was done to you and that shouldn't have been done to you. But what I want you to get out of this passage is that Jesus is making it very clear. It's not simply that we have issues. It's the desire to move past those issues and the desire to move past these moments so that God can do a transformative work in us so that we can never be the same. If I can't be transformed by the power of Jesus, I don't even know why I'm like in the building. Yet for many of you, you sat miserable on Thanksgiving this week. Because for you, Thanksgiving isn't a great holiday to get together with family. For you, Thanksgiving isn't a great holiday to get to reminisce. Thanksgiving for you is just a big, giant reminder of your failures and of your mistakes and of where you thought you would be in life and where you wish you were in life. And what I'm telling you today is that what Jesus was trying to get to his disciples is, look, stop worrying about why you are the way you are. Stop worrying about the issue that you've been dealing with and start asking Jesus to do something in your life that can completely change you from the inside out. Let him do a work in your life that is, that is different. But in order for us to do that, we have to let go of some of the finger pointing that makes us so comfortable in the place that we're in now. See, so many of us find ourselves stuck because it's so easy to be stuck when I'm never looking ahead. I'm only looking behind me pointing a finger. And some of you, a few fingers you shouldn't be pointing, right? So, just kidding. Um, All right, anyway. Um, But the, the truth is, for many of us, the truth is that we miss on this moment, this transformational moment. And that is... That is that God deeply desires when he sees us and when we spend time with him and when we are in his presence to change us. He doesn't desire for us to stay in these same modes of our life. And some of us have lived in those modes for 10 and 20 and 30 years. And I want to say to you, God never meant for that to be you. God never meant for that to be you. God never meant for you, even when you have things that are difficult in your life, even when you have things that are hard in your life, that, that are, are painful and regretful minute moments, God never intended for you to stay there once you stepped into a relationship with him. He deeply desires to change us. And, and the, the Bible says, uh, the scripture says to, to take us from glory to glory, so that there is a consistent newness in who we are. That this new creation that he created isn't just a new creation for a season. The the concept is that there's a, a continual new creation in our life that is always taking place that makes us just a little bit more like him. But the problem is, for many of us, we find ourselves a lot like the Israelites in the wilderness. You know, depending on, depending on who you're reading, um, when, when you do the research, there's, there's this, there's this um, track that the Israelites could have taken when they were in the wilderness, in between the Exodus and in between the Promised Land. And depending on who you're reading, they say it would either have taken 11 months or 18 months, depending on who you're, depending on who you're talking about. And what's interesting to me is, how long did it take them? 40 years. Why did it take them 40 years? The Bible actually tells us in Joshua chapter 5 that no man that was of adult age or able to serve in the military ever that left Egypt ever saw the promised land. And for many of us, that is where we find ourselves in our own lives. That we, that we 
take a trip that should take a short season in our life for God to change us, for God to renew us, for God to, to make us just a little bit more like him. And then we find ourselves making it take 40 years because we live with these same issues and we never truly allow God to deal with those on the inside of who we are. And we find ourselves miserable. We find ourselves without the transformative power of God in our life because we're so stuck in thinking about, well, this happened to me when I was a teenager and this happened to me as an adult. And, all, and this, person, this person hurt me and, and, and I, I, I should have been married right now, but now I'm divorced. And, and we find all of these, these places and those are very real pains and those are very real issues. And I'm not, and I'm not um, making light of them. But if we believe the things that we like sing about, and if we believe the things that we, we say about Christianity, that it is life transformational and that God wants to make us new, at some point we have to be willing to let the pain of those things that have happened to us go and move forward. At some point we have to be able to make that step. And I believe that this is a lot of what he was trying to get across to the disciples. Look, stop allowing the blindness that you have, not the blindness that the man had, not a physical blindness, but stop allowing the spiritual blindness of blame that you have to keep you from seeing the work that I'm supposed to do in this moment. You see, blame is just as blinding as physical blindness. It's blinding in different ways, but it is blinding. And if we're not careful if we're not careful, we will miss out on exactly what God desires to do in and through us to change us and to make us new. Why? Because we can't see the thing that God desires to do in us. So why do we find ourselves keeping in this, in this life of blame? Why do we find ourselves blind with blame? I think that there's a few reasons. I think number one, that for many of us, for many of us, we find ourselves um, with blame stuck because it's just easier. It's just easier. You know, if you're, not ha if you're uncomfortable with where you're at in life, if you're mad about something that's happened to you, it's so much easier to stay in that spot if it's somebody else's fault. It's so much easier if you have a hurt or a wound from somebody to point at and say, well, I am the way I am because this person did this to me. And so often, if we would have just let go of that anger and of that, that pain, that, that moment wouldn't even be a for, it wouldn't even like be something that we see in our reflection. But because we've held on to it, it's now a monument in our life. It's now this giant thing that we always look back to. It's now this giant thing that we always look at and we, and we say, well, if this hadn't happened, and Jesus is trying to say, look, if you'll just let that go, if you'll open your eyes that you can move forward and you're not as tied to this issue in, in this moment as you think you are, that there actually can be healing there. There actually can be deliverance there. There actually can be a moment where you have peace about that situation instead of it keeping you up on a regular basis when you replay it over and over in your head. But so often we just hang on to these things because it's just, it's easier. It's easier when it's somebody else's fault to not have all your stuff together. It's easier when it's someone else's fault to be, to be messed up because it's that person's fault. It's not yours. And I just want to ask you, at what point is it no longer their fault? At what point is you choosing to pick up with Jesus and say, I'm going to allow him to change me and move me and shape me into the person that he wants to be rather than allowing this person to have the control over you that they don't even know that they have? Have you ever gone to apologize for somebody for anger or, or frustration with them and they didn't even like, weren't even aware of the conversation? It's mind boggling how, how often, you hear that conversation so often with people. Men, you held on to it for years, you know, you were, you know, you were like having to massage your head, trying to get yourself to go to sleep, you were so angry at this person. This person didn't even know they offended you. Why? Because we hold on to things with blame and frustration longer than the other people ever know. I think another reason that we struggle with it is that we, for many of us, we just have a, a lack of understanding with how God works in our life. We struggle because we've heard so many different things said. We, we hear phrases like, 
um, well, God is in control. And when we hear the phrase that God is in control, many of us think, well, if God is in control, then where was he when I was divorced? Where was he when my wife left me? Where was God when my spouse cheated on me? Where was he when I had a crappy father or a crappy mother? Where was he when I was sexually abused as a child? Where was he when... I gotta be honest with you. We have built up this idea of the way that God works in a way that is in no way right. And we have people that, that they, they can only rationalize it one of two ways. If God is in control, then that means either he did this to me because he is mad at me, or he did this to me because he's trying to teach me something. And I want, I want everybody to hear me this morning. God does not do destructive things to his people. Whether he, because he's mad at you or because he's trying to teach you something. God's instruction, God's teaching always is focused on bringing us to a place of wholeness. And it is never something that brings us into a place of pain and personal destruction. And for many of you, if you tend to believe this thinking, you probably blame God for most of your issues that this awful thing happened to me, and if this awful thing hadn't have happened to me, then I wouldn't be where I am right now. That this wouldn't be, this wouldn't be, this isn't my fault. God did this to me. And what I want you to hear this morning is that there is a difference between being all-powerful and having all control of everything that happens on a planet. And, and God, because we live in a sinful world, there are things that happens that God does not put his hand on. And they are awful things and they are sinful things. It doesn't make him less powerful, but what the word does tell us that he will do is he will take that thing that happened that had nothing to do with him. And if you'll allow him to, and if you'll let go of the blame that you've been carrying around and the, and the pain and the shame of those moments, the Bible tells us that he'll turn it into something that is good. God. Now, there's a difference between being good with something that has happened to you and God turning something into something that is good. And the word tells us that he takes all things and turns it into the good for those who love him. In other words, for those who will allow him to work in his life. For many of us, we, we jump on the blame wagon because we just simply have a bad understanding of what it means for God to work in our life. Maybe you've been taught some things, maybe you've been told some things that make it seem like God is working almost against you if you don't do exactly what he wants you to do every step of the way. And let me free you this morning. No matter, no matter how how much you can rationalize it. God doesn't do destructive things to his people. And you can allow that blame to fall away and stop carrying that blame with God and move into a, a period of healing and restoration in your life. You can still hold on to it if you really want to, but you're holding on to it based on something that is false. Another reason that I think we, we get stuck with blame and we're blinded by blame is that we just simply don't like where we are in life. I don't know about you, but I, th I think everybody has gone through a season where they look at their own life, and whether it's in relationships, or it's in their finances, or it's in um, wh whatever, whatever you want to call it, your career, I think we've all found places where we wake up and go, I really just don't like where I'm at right now. We're disappointed in where we're at. We're, we haven't made it to the place that we want to be at, and we're frustrated with that. We see this, we see this in, in people of all ages. We see young people that are just super frustrated with, with where they're at in life. We see, we see uh, people uh, of any other age in this church that they just they, they hit a season where, where it's just not going the way that they want it to, and, and it becomes frustrating. But rather than dealing 
with this thing that is frustrating to them, rather than dealing with this thing that is frustrating and moving on in their life, they become blind to what God is trying to do in them, and they stay stuck. Because it is easier to point a finger at somebody than to let it go and move on. And we find ourselves just not moving. We find ourselves just locked in this place where, where I can't, I can't f- move forward because, because this thing happened to me. And in our heads, we've, we've made that a, a stopping point for us. And for still some others, it's not only that, but it could also be, it could also be that you've just found your identity in blame now. You are the person that was cheated on. You are the person that is divorced. You are the person that just never seems to get out of financial issues. You are, you're just that person. And you walk around with that weight. You are the person who just can't trust people because this thing happened or that thing happened. And you have allowed that to be your identity. And I, I wanna say this to you. You can be that person but you can't also be a Christ follower. Because I can't sit and find my identity in these things that have happened to me and find my identity in the resurrection of Jesus. They don't work together. It doesn't, they don't fit, they, they can't work. And, and you, you choose, you choose that. You choose to live with that identity that is painful. Or you choose to accept that, you know what, I don't have control over what's happened. I don't have control over this thing, but I can move on in Jesus' name. I can let it go in Jesus' name. I can be a different person, a new creation in Christ Jesus because of what he did on the cross at Calvary. I don't have to hold on to these things anymore. And whether, whether you are someone who it just is easier to point a finger or you're unhappy with where you're at or you found identity in it. God is speaking to us just like he spoke to his disciples and he's saying, it doesn't really matter why you are where you are right now. What matters, what matters is your willingness to turn to Jesus and allow him to do a work in you that is life-changing. So why do we find ourselves, how, how do we move forward? How do we get out of this place? How do we, how do we move? For, for those of y'all who, and most of y'all probably don't know, uh, very few people know, um, but I have had, um, I blame my parents on this one. I'm gonna go ahead and throw that out there. I have horrible dental genetics. I don't know how many, how many of y'all got bad teeth? Like, like you just like, like your teeth break, you got bad teeth issues. I have horrible tooth genetics. Um, and about 10 years ago, I broke the next to the last tooth in my mouth eating, well, no, I was chewing gum and it, and it broke. And then on the bottom of my mouth, about four years later, I broke the same tooth in alignment in the same spot. It broke the, almost the exact same way. And I've had two broken teeth in my mouth for um, six years, one for 10. And it has been every two, three times a year, it just becomes the most painful thing on the planet for me. I mean, it's like keep you up all night kind of pain. Um, and I kind of figured out how to, how to deal with it. Um, like through, you know, if I take this many Advil and I buy this many bottles of Gel, and, you know, you just kind of, you know, you, you play doctor because I didn't have dental insurance at the time. And I was like, well, we'll figure this out. And so, uh, you know, I, I kind of figured out a regiment that was beginning to work. And sure enough, Sunday night, we were, um, we, I was getting ready to, to preach this morning and, um, and we were getting ready to go out of town for Thanksgiving. And sure enough, just immediately, I just started feeling that pain go across my gums. And I knew what that meant for this week. I knew it was gonna be miserable. I knew, because while I could subside the pain with all of this stuff that I knew kind of worked, I, ju- I was just stuck. Like I knew it was gonna be an awful experience for the next few weeks or for the next few days. And we, we got in the car, it had been two days. I hadn't slept much the, last couple, the, the next couple of days. I was just in miserable pain. 
And um, I told Jessica, I said, hey, when we get to Crestview, because we were driving to Birmingham, we're gonna have to stop um, and I'm gonna have to go get some, some stuff so that I can make it on the trip to Birmingham because I'd ran out of a couple things. And I went into CVS and I bought my stuff and I got back in the car ready to do my regiment. And she, she looked at me and she said, why, why haven't you fixed this yet? She was like, why haven't you like gone and taken care of this? And I, and I said, well, it's expensive. It's gonna require an oral surgeon to cut out. And she was like, well, we have like pretty good dental insurance. Why don't you just go to where you're supposed to go and just get it fixed? I had lived, we've been here for four years. We've had dental insurance since we moved here. I had, I had been so locked in to this regiment of when this pain comes in my life that this is how I'm gonna deal with it and this is how I'm gonna acclimate myself to it. That I had forgotten that I had a way out. I'd forgotten that I had a way out. When Jesus ends this little, this little dialogue with the blind guy, when he does that really disgusting thing where he spits on the ground and he makes mud. <laughs> it's a good thing he was blind because he probably would have ran away, right? <laughs> you, know? Oh my, you know, that's just gross. He, he puts this stuff on his eyes and he tells him to go to the pool of Siloam. This, this word literally means to go to the familiar, to go to the thing that you know. Not just, to, like, it was a familiar spot. It was, not just, it was not just a random place Jesus was sending him. He was sending him to a place to receive his miracle that he already knew about. It wasn't a new place. And, if, and what I want to say to you this morning is if you're in here and you, you have a, a moment in time that you have encapsulized in your heart, that this is that that all of these issues are, are because of this and and you sit there with this blame you're doing exactly what I did in the car and that was forgetting that there was a familiar place that I could go to to receive my healing why because Jesus has already met with me and when I am open to to what Jesus wants to do in me that that pain that shame all of those things that have blinded me to the transformation that Jesus desires to do in me can begin to disappear it can leave and it doesn't have to stay you don't have to be in the same place that you were next Thanksgiving doesn't have to be miserable for you there are three or four of you in here that that when like you thought you got through Thanksgiving and you were almost irritated this morning that we talked about Thanksgiving today because it's such a point of frustration for you with the with the, some kind of a family dynamic. And what I want to say to you this morning is allow God to move you to a place where next year it's enjoyable. Let go of the blame that is in your life for the things that you've dealt with. And just like the man who was blind, begin to see what God wants to do and desires to do in and through you. Let's bow our heads. I don't, I don't want to call you up to the front. I, 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 want, to, I want to be pretty quick about this, but I, I just, I, I deeply feel like there is a large number of people in here that there is a moment when, when I talk about a moment that you hold on to, a moment that constantly causes you pain, a moment that still frustrates you, and it's been years, that when we talk about that, when we talked about that this morning, it keeps on popping up, it keeps on coming up in your head. And you just say, I just want to be free of that. I wanna move forward with Jesus. I don't wanna be stuck. I don't wanna be blind to my own blame anymore. I wanna move forward. And if God can do that inside me, I want that. If that's you, Nobody's looking around, it's just me and you. Would you just raise your hand all over this room? Hey, leave the house lights up for me just a little bit, guys. All over this room, yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hands are going up all over the room. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good. Father, I pray for every person that's lifted their hands this morning. I pray that you would 
uh, touch them. I pray that you would begin to just pull off the veil that blinds them to where they are. That God, you do have a hope and you do have a future for them. You do have something that you want to do in and through them that is life changing for them, God. And they can walk away even in this moment and say that these things I now have a peace over because I have met with God. Do that work in them right now, even in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen.